and it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's going to take me a second here to uh, figure out how to share my screen. So just uh, let me get that. Not a problem. Opened up. Can okay. everyone see that? We can see that. All right. And can you hear me all right? We can hear you well. And then if you just put it into, there you go, slideshow mode. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, thanks to all of you for being here. And I think that um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll get through these slides in enough time to leave some questions if, if people have them. Um, what, I, what I really want to just talk about is a little bit of just introduction to my philosophy on advocacy in general, and then um, some more nuts and bolts about really how to get started um, doing advocacy, because it's not, it's not necessarily something that's natural um, that we just um, fall into. And so sometimes we have to actually be a little bit purposeful about trying to, to get involved. So to start with just, you know, what is, what is advocacy? And I mean, in general, it's doing things to, you know, to advocate or to try to help yourself or others. As, as a physician, I see advocacy really in, in everything that I do, um, from seeing patients to doing research. Um, I, I, you know, I, I argue with insurance companies frequently um, and I teach students and residents and, and I do have a personal pet peeve that our hospital has what they call patient advocates, uh, which only come into play when someone's upset with something at the hospital and, and it implies that um, I'm not one. And so I, I, I keep trying to get that term changed to something other than patient advocate, because that, that's what I think I am. But um, I'm losing that battle at this point. It's not that actually that big a deal. Um, as people with disease or patients or, um, you know, what, whatever the exact right term for that is, there's a lot of self and community advocacy that, uh, that we can be involved in. I think that advocacy is, is personally rewarding, um, obviously practically in that we can advocate for ourselves as far as um, uh, getting medications approved or testing approved or just you know, getting people to listen to us about what our concerns are and our needs are. I think advocacy is also healthy. I think being proactive actually has a therapeutic benefit to it. Even if we don't necessarily physically feel better, uh, there, there is some fairly decent evidence about uh, the benefit to people's overall health and well-being by being engaged and being uh, uh, being active in their own in their own care. It's also very rewarding to the community of, of people with uh, with similar uh, issues. Uh, reducing stigma obviously is a big one in in headache disorders. Um, convincing convincing people that that headache disorders are more than than quote unquote just a headache. Um, Supporting research that then furthers the, the ability to understand disease as well as develop new treatments. Uh, education for ourselves, for our families, for other people with the disease, um, for our providers. Really, there's, there's not a single person out there that doesn't need some form of, of education. Um, and then being involved in support groups where we really actually do the work to, to build each other up and to, and to support each other. Um, to me, advocacy, uh, both professional and patient advocacy, um, is a tool to, to magnify our ability to impact the lives of people with headache disorders beyond, you know, for me, what I can do seeing them one patient at a time or just beyond taking care of our own physical needs. Uh, again, professional advocacy, things like GME funding, so graduate medical education funding, reimbursement, uh, NIH funding, and so ways that you know, that professionals tend to participate this in this is headache on the hill or neurology on the hill where we go to Washington DC the academy of neurology has things called calls to action where we you know send letters or call on certain issues and then patient advocacy which i think is more you know for this group which is really about advocating for access to care and educating our our uh, politicians and and our our peers and and our doctors working on improved insurance coverages. Um, the cost of drugs is outrageous and uh, working to try to improve that. 
and places where this can can happen is Headache on the Hill, which is a it's a nice event that's actually both uh, providers and patients working together to to lobby Congress, uh, just doing public awareness, patient education, support groups, and of course uh, events that uh, are put on by Miles for Migraine. Um, all right, what happened? What, didn't advance. All right, so my my screen is not advancing. Let me try this. There we go. Sorry. So, and I think that advocacy has a lot of uh, a, a lot of adjectives for it. I mean, to me, advocacy is engaging, and and I'm just going to show some personal pictures um, because I, you know, that's what advocacy is to me. Um, that's a chance for me to um, meet with uh, one of our U.S. senators. Uh, who some consider to be the most powerful man in the Senate currently as the most moderate Democrat in the Senate, Joe Manchin. Um, that is not my wife and kids. That's actually Dr. Mitzi Payne, who's a pediatric neurologist and her two sons. Uh, on the right is me with our other U.S. Senator, uh, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, and the group of us uh, in D.C. in front of the Capitol. Uh, participating in advocacy can actually just be good for you. Um, she, it was mentioned that I, I started an organization called Running for Research. Uh, that organization is now actually folded into Miles for Migraine, so it's, it's no longer a standalone organization. But we, uh, we created 5K runs to raise money for research. And so in the picture on the left, I'm running with, with one of my headache uh, physician colleagues. And in the picture on the right, that's me staying with uh, head coach Bob Huggins of the WVU men's basketball team who I will say is the uh, fifth winningest coach in all of uh, college basketball history and uh, hopefully a uh, inductee into the uh, College Basketball Hall of Fame soon. Um, advocacy can be rewarding. So um, obviously it, it pays off sometimes. It doesn't always pay off completely tan tangibly, but certainly does pay off. Uh, this is just uh, me standing with a very good friend of mine and one of the original migraine advocates, uh, patient advocates, Terry Robert, uh, with David Dodick, who at the time was the president of the American Migraine Foundation, uh, presenting them with a, a ridiculously oversized check. And then sometimes advocacy isn't always successful. And uh, we probably don't have time on this, um, this whole talk, but if you're ever interested in seeing one of my failures in advocacy, uh, go to YouTube and uh, look up hot wings for headaches. Um, it was a great idea. It was an excuse to get some free wings, but uh, uh, ended up uh, slying it, dying a slow, uh, painful death and being unsuccessful. So uh, not everything that we do in advocacy is actually going to pay dividends, and that's okay, because oftentimes uh, trying is, is the payoff. So, and just quickly, my, my personal journey in advocacy. I, um, I, I was from West Virginia, or I am from West Virginia. I had been away for a while. And uh, when I came back to West Virginia, I was really shocked by just the, the, the challenges that my patients had been having and trying to get uh, adequate headache care. But I didn't know where to start. I didn't have any idea what to do. And thankfully, I, I uh, was contacted about a program through the Academy of Neurology called the Palatucci Advocacy Leadership Forum which was a training program for people who were interested in advocacy, but didn't know where to start. And uh, so I had the opportunity to, to go to this weekend course and, and really just get trained in all aspects of advocacy, as well as get connected with a number of other people who were interested. And I, and I think actually that's one of the biggest things that's needed in advocacy is connections with other people who wanna do it because it can be very lonely. And, and so finding people to work together on, with on projects um, or to just support each other's individual projects uh, can be very rewarding and helpful. I then started participating in Neurology on the Hill and Headache on the Hill like we talked about. I was involved in the advocacy uh, committees and, and subcommittees of the Academy of Neurology. Uh, I did start running for research and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, which eventually um, became part of Miles for Migraine. Uh, one story I'll tell you um, about, um, so, well, I'll say that no, there's really is no such thing in advocacy as a complete failure. There's only only a pause. Um, so when 
when Botox got FDA approved for migraine, the West Virginia State Medicaid program went from actually approving it in the past to no longer approving it. And they didn't just not approve it. Like there was no pathway to get Botox if you had uh, West Virginia Medicaid. And I I fought this battle for years and years, um, thought that I had gotten close and, and didn't, and finally had almost given up um, on trying to convince our state Medicaid, which in West Virginia is a very significant uh, number of our patients. Um, and had almost given up. And then finally one day I just got angry and I got together a bunch of my colleagues uh, at, at West Virginia University, as well as at one of the other academic institutions in the state, Marshall University. And we all wrote a letter together uh, explaining the rationale for Botox. And then other than just sending it to the West Virginia Medicaid folks, we sent it to the governor, we sent it to the president of the, uh, of the Senate and to the house and we sent it to every major newspaper in the state. Um, and about a week later, I got notified that Botox was gonna be covered for West Virginia Medicaid. I'm not sure which of those letters uh, made the difference, but um, it was something different than I'd tried before. And so the, the point of that is just to say, uh, don't give up even if you have not succeeded uh, multiple times. And then actually because of that relationship that I developed and, and I did over time develop a relationship with the West Virginia Medicaid leadership. When the CGRP antibodies came out, um, they actually approached me about, you know, how to develop a, a, an authorization pathway to make them available. And so, so sometimes the relationships that we make during our advocacy can actually pay off down the road uh, with other issues as well. So one of the things that if we're looking at advocacy, there, there are a number of questions that we have to ask ourselves. And um, first one is where to start. You know, how do, we, how do I know what I'm going to advocate for? Well, the first thing is, what do you care about? Uh, what, what makes you passionate about something? Because we're, we will always be the best, most uh, motivated advocates for things that we personally care about. Um, and and it, it's certainly you can, you can advocate effectively for things that you don't really personally care about as long as you know that they're important. But if it's something that's really on your radar or something important, that's where you should really look at what, what can I do in this area? So if you're really upset about the fact that drugs are ridiculously priced and you, uh, you may not be able to afford something that you think would be helpful or you had something that was helping and then you weren't able to get it uh, or things like that, that may be an area that really drives your, your, your energy and something to, to focus on. The other part, is what's your skill? Um, some people are skilled in public speaking. Some people are skilled in letter writing. Some people are skilled in supporting other people who are excellent public speakers or letter writers. Um, obviously, again, you don't have to be the best at something to be effective, but if you have a combination of a passion and area and a certain part of that that you're really good at, that's that may be an area where you would be the most effective advocate. Then, then comes the question of how do you find the time to do it? Um, what's the value in your doing and what you're doing? And, and you have to first convince yourself and what is the value in what I'm doing? Um, and and this, this value then has to outweigh the cost, right? So there's obviously the time cost of, of from work or from your family. There's also the time cost from your, your uh, disease yourself. You know, how if you have disabling migraine attacks on a, on a regular basis, how do you find time between those to then become an effective advocate? And, and that can be a challenge and it's something that, that actually has to be thought about and planned out. Um, and then again, back to having, having partners in this is finding your team. Who's gonna help you along the way? Who, who do you need? Who, who needs you? Who can you partner with effectively to, to work together on, on pushing issues that are important? So, some brief things that I would just suggest for someone who, uh, who is either a, has a headache disorder or is a caregiver for someone with headache disorder or just cares about people who have headache disorders um, and places where you could think about getting started. One is Miles for Migraine. I think it's an, it's an excellent organization. Obviously they're sponsoring this event and, um, and, and I'm on their board, but I, I thought these things before that. Uh, it's part of the reason that my organization joined Miles for Migraine is that uh, 
I thought they were doing great things and we could do uh, great things together. Uh, from their from their 5K run walk events um, to their educational events like these, um, I, so many things that Miles for Migraine is doing that you can be part of. There are other organizations like Champ, Cluster Busters, you name it. There is a headache disorders organization out there to potentially get involved in. Um, talk to your provider about what's available locally. Um, there may be a support group or an organization locally or just a need. And and your provider may know of, of there being a need in your area that, that you could help with. One of the things you really have to do is educate yourself about uh, headache disorders and in, in, in the area that you're gonna advocate for, um, making sure that you, um, you are one of the best educated people in the room when you, when you have these conversations. And, and I'll, I'll go back to the picture I showed you with, with Terry Robert uh, and I, uh, uh, and, and I can share this because Terry has shared it in the past and told me, you know, and she had been a, a, a headache sufferer for a long time uh, before I moved back to West Virginia and she ended up becoming my patient. And one of the first things I said to her when I saw her is, uh, you're going to be difficult for me because um, you probably know more about everything I'm going to say than what I know about it. And so um, I can't get away with uh, blowing any smoke at you. And she said, yeah, you're right. And we had a great relationship, have a great relationship and, and working together. Uh, but it's, it's important that you know a lot about your own disease. Simple things that you can do in a particular area, just email and call your state national representatives. Even if there's not a particular issue, just to say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I live in your district and I care about headache disorders. I care about migraine, I care about cluster, wh whichever disorder. And then I really hope that when, those, when things related to this come up, that you'll consider supporting them um, because these are important to me. Uh, and, and I can tell you that uh, what I, one of the things I have learned with politics is that um, not volume as in how loud you are, but volume as in the number of contacts they get uh, from different, uh, different people really does have a big impact on, on how, uh, how much they focus on an issue. Um, and then the last thing I would say is you know, for 2022, apply to go to Headache on the Hill uh, if you can. It, obviously not everyone can do that. Um, th there's a bit of a cost burden to it as well as just a, a physical burden of, of being in DC for, for a couple of days. But it's a great opportunity to really see how at least political advocacy uh, can work. Uh, you get to be together with great advocates and really be inspired uh, towards doing more. And then really the, the point of this talk, I know it's taken me a long time to get to the point of the talk, but is once you to figure out what you want to do, how do you figure out how you're going to do it? And uh, you need to have a plan. And, and I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's actually true. If you don't have a plan, you're really hoping that you can just do it with luck. Um, and if you could do, if you were lucky, um, you probably wouldn't have a headache disorder. So you probably need a plan. Um, we, when we count on things to be done by luck, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be far less successful in general. And so this is the, the plans of action planning. Um, how, do we, how do we break down what we want to do into its component parts and set out a plan and a timeline and a guideline for how, we, how we're successful? This is something that I learned through that Palatucci program that I mentioned earlier. And I've, I have reapplied it uh, a number of times. Some of what I'm, the examples I'm going to give you are when I decided I wanted to start running for research as a and to do 5Ks, um, I went through this action planning process to lay out how I wanted to do it. And so the, the first step is really what is the issue? What do you want to focus on? What do you want to address or solve? And actually write it down and describe it. And so for me, my first one was headache and migraine research is woefully underfunded, leading to limiting, limited understanding of disease process and limited progression towards treatment options. Um, and so that, that's what I defined as my, as my issue. Your issue may be that uh, uh, drug costs are so high that I can't afford a medication that I think would be helpful for me. That is, that is an issue. Or many people with migraine can't afford medications that will be helpful, helpful to them. It, it doesn't matter what the issue is, write it down, kind of define what it is so that you know what you're actually trying to address. The second step then is what is your goal? Okay, so if you define the problem, then define the solution. What do you, what do you want to be your outcome? 
and, and how do you know if you'll be successful? So again, for mine, it was to raise money to be used for headache and migraine research by organizing a 5K race and a one mile walk. Um, and uh, you just need to figure out how will I know when I have hit the end zone? Um, uh, otherwise you may end up uh, pointing in, in a different direction than you had intended. It's also important, I think, to give a reason. And this is not so much for yourself because you know internally what your reason is, but someone may ask you, why are you doing this? You know, why are you putting, putting time into this? Um, so why should you care? Why should other people care? Uh, and again, it's, it may seem tedious, but writing these things down and really thinking about how you're going to answer the question can be very helpful in moving forward. So again, for me, it was, and at the time, the number was 36 million, but uh, that number has changed over the years. But migraine affects 36 million people in the United States. And migraine and other headache conditions are often severely disabling and costly to individuals and society. Research in these areas is limited in large part due to lack of funding. Okay, and that was something, if someone asked me, why are you doing this? I could say that in 10 seconds and, and they would understand why I was moving forward. So define your reason, that's your purpose. It's, you know what the problem is, you know what, you're, what you hope the solution is. Now you have to say, why are you going to do it? And then we really start to break it down, okay? So if you say, I wanna fix Medicare, I mean, that's a great goal, but you, what, that's, a, that's a thousand yard goal, what's the first step? And with anything, it really is important to break it down into its component parts. And to, you know, what, what am I gonna do first? What am I gonna do second? What are, and, and spell it all out. And again, this is a tedious process. It's not always 100%. I think this part will change over time as you have success in one area, it'll, it'll alter. But it's good to have this skeleton framework of, of what am I going to try to do? And uh, so I've outlined mine there. I'm not going to read it out for you. But you can see it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's pretty nuts and bolts. Um, even, you know, come up with a name, uh, come up with a location, come up with a date. You know, these are all things that I needed to do to be able to, to start you know, my event and, and, and move forward with this. Uh, for you, it may be find my congressman's office phone number. Um, understand how a bill becomes a law, um, figure out who at the, um, at my insurance companies, at my insurance company, who makes the decisions about what's covered and what's not. I mean, these are just little steps that have to be accomplished before you can get to the big step of whatever your goal is. As part of the actions to take, then it's important to then decide, okay, who is my audience? Who do I, who, and who do I need to work with me? Um, each one of these steps, you may be able to accomplish on your own, but you may also need someone's help or someone, someone's involvement. Tie each of those people into one of the steps and actually have, have each step defined with uh, an audience or a person or a group of people that you, that you need. Assume that people are going to say yes, okay? They're not going to always, but, but go in with the assumption that people will want to help you. If they don't, don't take it personally. People have a lot of reasons for saying no. Some of them are nefarious and some of them are just, they have other things that they're doing and, and, and don't have the time or the energy or the passion. But I think it's always important to go in with the assumption that people are going to, to step up and be helpful. And then along those lines also then is, what are the resources that are needed for each step? And again, some of the steps are free and easy and the resources, a cell phone, which you probably already have. Um, some of them may be financial, space, time. Um, tie each one of these into one of the actions so that you um, really can, can spell out with each step, this is what I need to do and this is what I'm going to need to be able to do it. Give them all dates. Okay. Now, you have, to be, you have to be very flexible on yourself with these dates. Show yourself grace because you're going to not hit all of your dates. But it's important to have dates and goals because if not, it's too easy to put it off till tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Um, tie each of these actions to a date that you're going to try to have them accomplished by um, so that you have some pressure on yourself, some, some accountability to getting each step completed. And then define how you're gonna know if you were successful. And I think actually this one may be the most important part. 
um, define a lot of simple success measures, even if they seem silly, like successfully found so-and-so's phone number. The reason for this is that, and I hope you guys ha have the same experience that I do. If I set myself one big goal, uh, I tend to bog down partway through. If I set myself 10 goals, I get excited every time I can check a box and it helps me to be motivated to go to the next goal and go to the next goal. Um, it's kind of like if you want to lose weight, you don't say I want to lose 50 pounds in six months. You say I want to lose four pounds in one month or I want to lose one pound in one week. You know, those goals are attainable and tangible and you can see them. Um, I mean, if you've lost 50 pounds in six months, good for you. But most people who start with that particular goal end up giving up um, uh, after things go slower than expected. So just provide yourself an opportunity to celebrate and, uh, and, and have successes. So I'm gonna wrap up there um, and leave some time for questions, but just to conclude, advocacy, first of all, is 100% needed. There's no such thing as a bad advocate. There are more and less effective advocates, but participating in advocacy, advocacy is, is good and necessary. Uh, it can be hard, it can be time consuming, it can be uh, fatiguing, uh, but it can also be very fun. Um, doing it with others, making good friends, um, just having doing fun events and, and seeing the fruits of your labor. And that ties into the rewarding part. It, it, it can be very rewarding as long as you um, are in it for the long haul. Uh, be careful if you're looking for quick fixes because those are few and far between. Um, and giving yourself some grace, remember that advocacy isn't your job or your responsibility. So I think that everyone could benefit from being involved in advocacy, but if you don't have it in you right now, that's okay too. Don't force yourself into something that's just going to make your life harder or worse, uh, is going to drain whatever residual resources you have left. If you need to take care of yourself or you need to take care of someone else, let that be your advocacy and let and let more outward advocacy wait until you're in a better place to do it. Make sure that you are focusing on things that you care about um, and it's easier when it's something that you're also good at. Uh, and remember that advocacy can change your life uh, and it can change someone else's life. Uh, it may not change someone's life for 50 years, if, depending on what we're, advo if we're advocating for NIH funding. You know, we may discover something that, you know, that doesn't make an impact for 50 years in people's actual lives, but um, what we're doing in advocacy actually uh, can make a difference in, in your own and someone else's life. And I think that is my last slide. And so I'm going to stop sharing. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to take them or um, you all can have a little bit of time back. I'm on mute, sorry. Um, that was excellent. Um, I do not see any questions. Does anybody have any questions? We have a small group. If you do, you're welcome to unmute yourself and um, direct questions um, directly to Dr. Watson, if you would like. Um, if not, I, I'll share a few things as well. Um, as um, I said in the beginning, and I think um, Dr. Watson also pointed out, we have, um, we have support groups and um, so attending a support group is advocating for yourself as well. That's part of, that's part of being an advocate. Um, while that's advocating for yourself, you're, advocate, you're being an advocate. Um, and I, we also have volunteers that work um, with it, not work, that volunteer for Miles for Migraine and I have different, um, eight different volunteer committees that um, volunteers work with me um, and Miles for Migraine from editing committee to communications committee to, um, they're all different things that, that people can help Miles for Migraine with. And so um, tomorrow I have a call at two and a call at seven with people that would like to volunteer with Miles for Migraine to just go over the different, different um, teams that we have. We call them teams, not committees teams sound friendlier. And um, so I had sent an email out to, um, and I'm just talking a minute because we do have a little extra time. Um, I had sent an email out to um, 
support group facilitators and volunteers for Miles for Migraine. And I just asked them if they could give me some quotes to share tomorrow um, about how Miles for Migraine has helped them or what it means to be a volunteer or a support group facilitator. And I just wanted to share some of the quotes that just kind of, I didn't have time to look up my slides, but um, some of the things that they have said about volunteering and advocating with Miles for Migraine. So um, they, I, and I've quickly jotted down four quotes. Um, someone had said that they have found new friends that understand them. So as Dr. Watson had said, um, working with and volunteering with and being with people that um, have migraine and that you're advocating with and you're working together. Um, when you start to come together with a group that are like you and that have migraine, all of a sudden you're with people in a support group or even your volunteer group. You, you have migraine and you all all of a sudden understand each other. And just over the last two years, I have made some of the best friends and some of the dearest friends. We all have migraine and we all just totally understand each other and totally get each other. And the best part of volunteering and being with Miles for Migraine is that if you join a committee or you're a support group leader and we have um, two for every support group, when we don't feel well, it's like, you don't have to explain yourself. You're just like, I, I, you know, can't make this meeting or I can't, I can't facilitate with you tonight, Katie. It's like, it's, it's okay. I got it. So it, that's one of the best things is that you all just get each other. Um, someone else said that um, it's given their self-esteem back because um, they have come out of their shell and that they found that they could they felt like because they had migraine, they couldn't do something, but because they were able to not feel that they had this timeline that they had to keep, um, it gave their self-esteem back because they could do something when they felt well and they didn't feel pressured to, you know, do something at this, you know, strict rate of time. Um, and so it gave them so much of their um, self-esteem back. It lessened um, another person's depression because they were helping each other. They were advocating for this disease that they um, that they lived, and they were they were fighting. Um, I've gone to headache on the hill twice, um, and oh my gosh, I felt myself when I left headache on the hill two years ago. I was there in person. This year, I was there virtually. When I left two years ago, I felt like I was on, I don't know, cloud 57. I just, I felt like I was the best thing since sliced bread when I left there. I, I just, it was, it was um, Dr. Watson, it was the best thing ever. I felt empowered. I felt like, you know, I did so much good work for migraine. Um, and then another person said that they found their tribe working, volunteering at Miles for Migraine. She's a support group facilitator and she's on, I think, two, two yeah. teams, but she loves it. Does anyone want to share anything else? Has anybody on here um, done any advocacy work? Well, while people were thinking about yeah. that, a couple of, a question popped up on the, the chat. Oh, good. Um, and so thank you, Donna, for the question. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it, and really it's the question in case you get, I don't know if everyone can see the, the, the ALT. I don't know if everyone can see the chat or not, but it's um, basically not not really able to do volunteer, you know, um, outward volunteer work right now, but suggestions for advocating with employers and managers and colleagues. And, and that is a, it's a really, it's a really good one. And I think it can be, um, it can be a little bit daunting to do to open up. Uh, with people, that's that's I think one of the challenges of um, of advocating in, in where where you live or where you work is that you have to expose some of yourself, and because of the stigma of headache disorders, 
um, one of the things that that you know, the the national advocacy groups has found is that there there are actually a lot of you know there probably there are a lot of famous people with with migraine who are very hesitant to actually make that public because they're afraid it'll affect their ability to get work. Um, and so when some of the more recent people have come out uh, as, as people with migraine or other headaches, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been rewarding to see that, you know, highly successful people in a lot of areas um, also have, have struggled with this. So, but for more tangibly, I think it's, it's educating yourself first and really understanding your disease. Um, remembering that, and, and this is partly where the delicate balance comes in, that, that uh, and this is, I think, just human nature, that um, people that you work with, you know, usually people that you work with do want to know about, you know, about you personally. They want to know um, about things that are affecting you, they, and they want what's best for you, right? If you're a good manager, a good employer wants you to be your, the best employee that you can be, which means they need to care about your, your health uh, and wellness, uh, as well as just your ability to complete whatever task that you that you have at work, um, and so learning how to frame um, frame the disease uh, in a way that is, this is how it affects me. This is how, at times, it may um, you may see me doing things a little bit differently. Here are some of the strategies that I have developed to uh, to try to overcome that. Um, you know, come at it with the, with partly with the solution, not just the problem. Uh, sometimes there's not a solution. Sometimes it's just I I can't I can't do my job effectively today, um, and um, that's just how it is. Uh, but sometimes it's I may not be able to do it as effectively right now, um, but I can make up for it in these ways. Or because I have migraine, this makes me an asset in these areas. I may be able to relate with. A certain group of people that we do business with uh, in a different way because I understand them differently. Um, but I, it's being being open and honest, um, being careful not to make it the forefront of who you are. Don't let uh, don't let your headache disorder define who you are at work. Um, and I would say that that's actually true everywhere you go. Don't don't let it define you. Don't. The reason we've moved away from terms like migraineur and and things like that is that we want um, we we want you we want people to be people um, with conditions or diseases or disorders, not disorders with names. Um, so I, I, this isn't a very great answer. I, I realize that because I don't think there is a great answer. But I think that if you understand your disease as best you can and you're willing to share it um, openly and honestly and not rather than use it as an excuse, use it as a as a tool to educate and and how how you work around it and how at times you may be limited, but at other times you may be advantaged or successful. Um, I think that can be can be helpful. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, yeah. It looks like there's an oh hi Donna. Hi, <laughs> thank you for your thank you for your response. Um, I just. It was, it was actually very helpful, but um, one with about the idea of not having a headache or migraine define us, I do try to be open in my workplace and I'm a physical therapist and I work in a large healthcare system and it's funny to have to have these conversations with healthcare providers, but um, even though because I'm talking about something that's fairly stigmatized and it's so unusual when I'm when I'm explaining to them what I'm experiencing I am I am kind of defining myself as as the Donna Donna has got migraines Donna's the the migraine girl or whatever so I feel like because it's so unusual for them when I do speak up about it it's it is they're seeing me that way and it's yeah. And, and right, I mean, and you can't, you can't avoid that entirely people. And, and I would say that's probably true with people with just about any, um, you know, any medical condition that at some point they get defined by it at times. Um, but it's, you know, it sounds like you're, you know, you're, you're working, you're helping patients, you're, um, and, and I would say, you know what, you, you having migraine is probably an advantage to you at times with some of the patients that you see in physical therapy. Um, some of them, I'm sure, 
have invisible physical therapy needs, right? That if they, you know, if someone sees them walking down the street, they may not notice anything is wrong about them necessarily, but you're able to understand the, 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 the struggle that they're going through um, that may not be evident on the outside. Um, and, uh, and many of them will have migraine is the other part of it. And I'm, you know, I'm sure as you're doing therapy, you spend a lot of time just talking to people um, as you discover that, you know, that a quarter of them probably have migraine. I think that actually is an advantage to you to be able to, to share that experience with them. Um, yeah, I was going to say that that might bring people maybe that have migraine that come into your practice. They might say, oh, I have the perfect, you know, physical therapist for you because maybe, you know, you might know some certain things that might help them where another PT person wouldn't. It would be, would be, you know, one thing that I might offer to you. Thanks. Would you mind if I jumped in also, Katie? Oh, no, not at all. Um, so one of the things I would say also is know your rights, Donna, um, and advocate for yourself. So if you think your disease qualifies under the Americans with Disability Act, then ask for an accommodation. Have proactively all the paperwork done, um, both from your doctor, but also your interactions with your employer. The reality is that many employers will, many employees will not get the accommodations unless you ask for it. And failing to do so could again start this negative cycle where you're continuing to you know, go through and, and have more and more migraine attacks. So um, it, it, I would say just be proactive in advocating for yourself, but more importantly also really know your rights and see if you qualify under some of the legal protections that you have. And another thing I'll share yeah. too, um, in our support groups, um, we talk about this a lot. It comes up a lot, um, people who, um, who work and they're not quite sure where their balance is or what accommodations they can ask for and that type of thing. Um, you know, I know I'm the support group um, coordinator, and, um, but I can't say enough about our support groups and joining one. You, you'll find out there's a lot of people out there such as yourself and talking about it with others, you can get good suggestions, good points, things that other people are doing that might, you might say, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Um, even something that I might not think about because I'm not in the, in the midst of it. So um, it's something you might want to think about um, and, and you don't necessarily have to join a support group with Miles for Migraine. There's, you know, other there's other organizations, migrant organizations that have support groups as well, but um, it might just be, you know, a good idea if one would fit into your time schedule. And Anika is going to speak next. She might probably, she might say the same thing as well. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, and I'll just finish. A Andy um, had put a comment on there about the, you know, advocacy on your own time schedule when you, when you can. And, and, you know, one way to look at it, and not that I'm, I mean, I would always encourage people to donate money to advocacy organizations. But if everyone in the United States who had migraine gave one dollar for research, that would be way, way more money than the NIH gives for migraine research. Okay. Um, now, we, we know that's not exactly how it's going to work. But if you think about that on an advocacy level, it if a bunch of people give 15 minutes of their time that, you know, with a number of people out there with, with migraine and other headache disorders, that adds up to an awful lot of advocacy work. Um, and so, and when you go to headache on the Hill and you go to, when I go to things like neurology on the Hill, what, what you see in these groups of, you know, a couple hundred people are, there's a small group of people who are like your advocacy warriors, you know, and they're, it's what they do for, for their life. And they, and they put in ridiculous hours. And, and if you allow yourself, you can kind of feel, um, you know, inadequate. Um, but what you have to realize is that 90% of people in the room are, are just like us, which is that we're, we're given a little. Um, and when you add a little bit up between, you know, a couple of hundred people, it's an awful lot. And so you, you really do have to be careful not to put too much pressure on yourself to be the person who gets something, you know, accomplished. It's, it's really about doing a small piece and letting someone else come in behind you and do a small piece and, and um, 
every, every inch that you move is one less inch that somebody else has to move. Oh, I like that. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> that's so that's, I love that. And I'm going to put that on my volunteer page. Um, it's so true. And volunteering, um, our groups maybe are one to two hours of your time a month. I mean, it's so it's not even a lot of work, but I like that. What every, uh, yeah, I really like that quote. Um, so, but it is, it's just taking a little bit away from someone else so someone else can help too. Um, do you, does anybody have any other questions or anything else um, for, for either, actually, either of our first two presenters? And if not, I am going to go ahead and introduce our third speaker of the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Watson. You're welcome. Enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. So for our third and our final presenter of the evening is not only our patient advocate, but she is my friend. And I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Anika Saleem. She will be sharing her personal advocacy journey with us. Anika has had migraine since childhood, but was diagnosed with chronic migraine with aura in 2015 after experiencing a severe migraine for nearly a year. She was just starting her PhD in epidemiology when her migraine attacks became daily episodes. Trying to manage her condition amidst full-time work and school, Anika felt alone as if no one understood the gravity of what she was suffering through. Learning more about her condition and connecting with others in the migraine community, Anika felt the strong urge to join the, join the movement and advocate for herself and others. She joined her first Miles for Migraine Walk Run in the fall of 2018 and increased her involvement in the Migraine Patient Education Days and Retreat Migraine, as well as other events. In 2019, she trained with the US Pain Foundation to become a support group leader. That's when I met Anika. Personally understanding the challenges associated with traveling for in-person meetings, in January 2020, Anika worked with Miles for Migraine to host and lead the first ever weekly Miles for Migraine national virtual support group. There, are over, there were over 85 registered participants and it continues to grow daily. Anika continues to share her journey and experience in an effort to increase migraine awareness and provide support to those suffering from migraine and their families. Whether it is migraine or another chronic condition, she wants everyone to know you are not alone. Anika, I'm proud to introduce you and it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have a lot of light in this room, so it looks a little Damn, I'm going to see. I just turned the camera on, so I'm going to see if I can uh, maybe brighten it a little bit. Um, it doesn't look like How is that better? Yeah, you, you look good. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, uh, Shruti and Dr. Watson, for your presentations. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, are you all able to see the presentation? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to share my advocacy journey and migraine, um, my journey living with migraine disease and tie it into how I navigate that in the workplace. So, okay. So um, in the bio, you heard a little bit about me. I work full time and up until uh, the summer of this past year, 2020, I was also in school full time, um, which is very challenging, but um, at least I can take one of those things off. <laughs> at least no more school full time. I'm glad to be finished. Um, one of the things I love to do is travel. I love traveling. I love seeing new places. Um, the area I live in, I don't have much family close to me. So usually I travel, I'll just hop in a car and just go for a weekend to see some family members in different states. Um, so if you are seeing me on social media, the, the few times I do get on there, I might post the picture of me traveling someplace, mainly because um, I've tried to find a way to 
live with my disease, but still try to do some of the things that I enjoy, even if I have to do them in a different way. Um, I love to eat. I cook. <laughs> I love to eat. I love to try new food. Um, I'm very extroverted. Most people that meet me um, um, after my uh, living with chronic migraine disease think I'm introverted, but that's because I'm just calm, but I'm very extroverted. I love people. I love talking to people. Um, I love spending time with people and getting to know people and their stories. Um, and another thing that I do enjoy is community service. I love um, reaching, connecting with the people in my community, whether it's providing food to people who may not be able to get food for themselves given their condition or just volunteering for different things. I um, volunteered and did a deployment for COVID-19 just to support. So different things like that, I still try to find a way to be involved with my community, even if it's not primarily focused on migraine or headache disease. And as Katie mentioned, I am a support group leader um, and I love it. I think that's probably one of my favorite things because in our group, no matter how awful I'm feeling, like I have to be to the point where I can hardly move to not join the call. <laughs> like you may see people, at least on my group, people would be on and have green lights on or people are just laying there under covers or some people don't even turn the camera on. But no matter how bad we're feeling, it's like we feel we feel so good in that meeting because it's amazing to be with people that understand and know what you're going, know it can relate. Even if our diagnoses are different or the type of migraine and headache disorder that we have might vary, it's the only place that I found that I truly can just say anything and people will get it. <laughs> um, so it's this, it's really a an amazing support system. And as you've heard almost everyone say, just find a group. Um, support is very important. We're not we're not here to be on our own. Community is important. Um, so I do want to just tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I've lived with chronic conditions my whole life. Um, I've I have had migraines since I was a child. However, I it was always I was always told that I'm just having a headache. Um, I can vividly remember one time that my um, that carried me from my bed to the car to the hospital because I was in that much pain. As a young person, this was the only thing that really took me to the emergency room besides the knee dislocation, which was pretty easy to determine what was happening. But I pretty much, that was the only reason. And it was always, um, I just needed to take some Motrin or something like that. And that followed me up into adulthood through college. So I've always had to sleep with water and Motrin by my bed. So I didn't get a diagnosis until 2015, and I was very shocked to find out that what I was experiencing was migraine disease. It took um, a long time for me to be convinced because like some people who've never experienced it or don't know, um, I just thought I was a headache could not cause the kind of symptoms and debilitating um, condition that I was experiencing. So I had to learn a lot about my condition when I was diagnosed. Um, before then, um, I, I had an, an, a car accident and that left me with a herniated protruder.